Welcome to the Ephraim Moravian Church. I bet some of you who are listening to me have never heard of the Moravian Church. I do get asked a lot of questions about it, so I think we should start with the background of where it began. We're going to have to go back in time about 600 years. We're going back to the early 1400s. Back then, in Czechoslovakia, what we know now is the Czech Republic, uh, there lived a man named John Huss, who, I'm sorry to tell you, went into the priesthood for several interesting reasons. One was he would be taken care of, two was he would have a good salary con permanently, and three, he just liked talking. Well, he became very much more religious after he became a priest. Good thing, isn't it? And so he began to read carefully the scriptures. He learned a lot about them. And he began to wonder if some of the church practices in the Catholic Church were not quite right. He thought that it was ridiculous to sell indulgences. The Catholic Church had started that long ago, and they had decided it was number one, a good way to make the people feel better about themselves, having paid a penance for having done something wrong, but it was helpful to the church coffers also. He thought that was terrible. He looked and looked, and he found that there was nothing about selling indulgences in the Bible. So, even though he got in trouble for it, they said, you must stop this immediately. He said, I cannot because it, nowhere in the Bible does it say that selling indulgences is a good idea, and for that and several other reasons, I can't stop telling these people that they can't do it. So, the church and the state were pretty much one at that time. Both of them were angry with him, because the church and the state obtained some of that money. So he had two people telling him that he was all wrong, and he said, I cannot change my mind. Well, he was invited to come to a big conference where all the Catholic theologians were present. And his friends told him, do not go. This is a trap. You will be sorry. He said, I must go. I have to stand up for what I believe in. So. Of course he went, and of course they t threw him in the dungeon. He became very ill and nearly died, but he recovered enough to stand trial. So when they, he got before all the Catholic higher-ups, and they uh, talked to him about this indulgence problem and a few other things that were bothering him, he said, I cannot recant, <coughs> excuse me, he, I cannot recant, because this is what I believe. So. They condemned him to death. In July, early July, they burned him at the stake. And you may know that in those olden days when there was an execution of any kind, people came to it. I find that abhorrent. But all these people came and watched the flames set on fire. Even just before they lit the fire, they asked him if he would like to recant, and he said no. So the fire was lighted, and as the flames got higher and higher, he began to sing a hymn. Some sources say he was repeating Bible verses. Either way, it was his way of being focused. And even after the flames were so loud that they couldn't hear him singing or speaking, they could see his mouth moving, so he, they knew he was still doing it. He was going to heaven the right way. That is such wonderful faith, I can hardly imagine it. Well, he had ob obtained a great many followers in those years when he began speaking, and I think that you will be surprised to learn that the church excommunicated him at one point, and he did not stop talking to people. He would gather people outside, and he would tell them what he thought about the Bible and about Jesus and about eternal life, and they loved him. So, they tried to stay together. 
for the next 50 years after he was put to death in 1415. They didn't organize, but they stayed together as a group of believers. You must know that in those days you couldn't talk about some other form of religion because somebody would tell on you and you would be in trouble with both the church and the state. So they met in secret. Well, they did get together and made a group of people which they called Unitus Fratrum. That's Latin for the unity of the brethren. And they were unified. And under this group, in the next hundred years, other people came along. And the most important one is John Amos Comenius, which was a good hundred years later. He was a, a orphan. His parents had both died. And he lived with his grandmother, who was a pietist. And he became very interested in the talking about the new way to look at Jesus and religion because of John Huss, and he became a great follower of his. John Amos Comenius was quite a scholar. He got all three degrees that I know about, his bachelor's, his master's, and the uh, doctorate. And after that, he began to write books. He wrote 40 books. Unfortunately, I can't speak Czech, so I can't read the books. But many people did read them. And one who read them has something to do with Ephraim. And that was a young man in Norway who was also a preacher in the Lutheran church. And he began reading everything he could get his hands on. He was just an insatiable learner. His name was Andreas Iverson. And he was in the Lutheran seminary close to graduation when he began to think, I think I like this Moravian religion better. So <laughs> he wrote to the Moravians in the center of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is where the Moravian uh, Central Committee is. And he said, I am about to graduate from divinity school. And I was going to be a Lutheran pastor, but I would much rather be a missionary for the Moravians. And I would like to go to South Africa. Will that be all right? So he really received a rather immediate letter back, if you can say immediate in those days when everything went by ship. He received a letter saying, thank you so much for your wishes to join us. And we would be happy to have you as a missionary, but Unfortunately, we don't need another one at this time in South Africa or anywhere in Africa. So we would suggest that you would come to Milwaukee. I don't know whether he had ever heard of Milwaukee or even Wisconsin, but he was disappointed and decided to do it anyway. He wanted to serve God. So he had a fiance and they got married and together they came to this country. It took three ships to get them here, and they uh, ended up in Buffalo, New York, and they found that they would like to stay overnight at least one or two nights to rest before they moved on. So they found a boarding house, which was run by a man also from Norway. This was a lucky accident. His name was Ole Larsen. In the olden days, when people learned English, they would say, Ole Larsen. Ole was quite a delightful man. He and his wife and children had a, this boarding house, and he and Iverson hit it off famously. The men sat up long into the night, the first night, talking, and long into the second night. And they finally ended up staying three days, and then Iverson said, we really do have to go on to Milwaukee. I know we'll never see one another again, but it has been wonderful to know you. So off they went on the way to Milwaukee, which was also a rough trip. You may know that back in those days, there weren't very many roads, and it was hard going. They took a uh, mule train for a while and several other conveyances. They didn't own a horse. They didn't have any money. They finally made it to Milwaukee, and they were greeted there by this little Moravian community. And he was going to serve as their pastor. 
it was very hard to have a community of people who didn't live anywhere near one another. Milwaukee is a pretty big city, was even at that time, if you had no form of transportation. And so, after standing on street corners here, there, and the next place, trying to convert people to his way of thinking, he thought, this is not really working very well. I wonder, maybe we should go on. So, he decided that they would push on to Green Bay. Green Bay was not called Green Bay in those days, it was called Fort Howard, and that is where he went. He didn't get to take any of his people with him, but, well, of course his wife, but when they did get there, it was not hard for him to meet other people and have them be interested in his way of thinking and being a Moravian. When he got there, he was quite shocked to meet Ole Larson again. Can't you imagine these two men who had met once, some years back, even though they were both Norwegian, they knew they'd never see each other again, and here they were. Pastor Iverson had to go and purchase something at a trading post, and Ole was there. Well, imagine, look at them, saying to one another, what are you doing here? Well, they both told each other the stories of what had happened since they last met, and Iverson said, you know, you not being able to find places where you can purchase your land, I might have an idea for you. Iverson had explained that they were building their cottages on the land of a man who was very nice to them, Otto Tank. He was a wealthy man from Norway who had also come over to this country, and he had become a Moravian somehow along the way, so he was thrilled to have these Moravian people coming. But he didn't want to give up his land. He just wanted them to build their houses on it. At first that sounded like a really nice idea, but after a while they began to think, you know, we made this trip from the old country, hoping to better ourselves in every way. We want to own our own homes and our own land. And the way it was now with their houses built on Otto Tom's land, if they wanted to move, they would have to leave the house behind. That didn't sit very well with them. So they told Iverson their wishes, and he said, okay, I'll speak to Mr. Tonk again. I'm afraid that didn't go very well. He was quite upset. In fact, we hear that he shouted about it. And so they began to wonder whether or not they should move on, and at that point is when Ole Larson told Iverson that they might want to come to the place he lived. It didn't have a name yet, it was just it Wisconsin. Wisconsin was not a very old state, about six years, I think, at that time, and Ole lived out on an island. We call it Horseshoe Island, and it is right off our bay. If I were outdoors, I could see it. On the maps, it's called Eagle Island. I wonder why they called it Eagle Island. Perhaps there was a family of eagles living on it, but I certainly know why they called it Horseshoe Island. It is shaped like a horseshoe. And in fact, if you are over in the park, especially if you're near Nicolet Bay, you can see right into the horseshoe, so you know it had a good name. Well, Ole invited them to come and look at this spare land that he knew about. So he told his parishioners, and they decided that it would be a good idea. Unfortunately, they did not choose a great time of year to do this. They picked February. They walked all the way from Green Bay. It took them three days and nights until they would get to Horseshoe Island, where Ole was happy to see them, fed them a nice dinner, let them all go to sleep, and the next day he brought them on his little boat. Uh, I'm sorry, that is not right. That was a different time. He brought them across the ice because it was February. The ice used to get three and four feet thick, so there was no problem in walking on it. So they walked across the ice and got to this area where we are right now. Of course, it was totally bare. There was no house for miles. And they looked around. I think they had to dig through the snow. In fact, Iverson says that he dug through the snow in order to take a look at the dirt to see whether it would be good for farmland. Uh, don't do that in the winter. 
you can't tell what the dirt is like. Ephraim does not have the best dirt. Ephraim is built on bedrock, and my goodness, it's a very big deal to try to dig a hole in it. But he didn't know that at the time, and he looked around at the beauty, and I think that when Iverson looked out across the water up and looked at that bluff on the other side of Ephraim, they thought, oh, this looks just like home. I've been to Norway, and I've seen many places that look just like this, so it's no wonder that they liked it a lot. So they made up their minds, they went back home and they, to Fort Howard and told all of their parishioners what they had thought and what did they think about moving to Ephraim where they would be able to purchase their own land. Well, they thought it was quite a good idea, but some of them had made friends outside of the congregation and didn't want to go. So Iverson said, well, I'm going to have to go and borrow money in order to purchase this land. Think about it. So he went to uh, central Wisconsin where they had this office that he could uh, agree to buy the land. And it cost him $500 to buy 400 acres. But a bishop down in central Wisconsin loaned him the money. We have never heard if that loan was ever paid back. But whether it was or not, it came out to be a very good thing because here we not only have a lovely little church and a lovely little village, but many people from many states have found us and they come here every summer. We enjoy it when they come. It's wonderful to see those familiar faces. Well, when he came back and told the congregation that he had obtained the land and that they were going to go in the spring, he said, you know, we do have to go in the spring because we will have to build houses when we get there. This is a wilderness. And they said, yes, yes, that'll be fine. So in May of that year, they came to Ephraim's shores. Iverson built himself a sailboat. He was a very smart man. He could do about anything. Design boats, design houses, preach sermons, talk on and on and on about God and never lose his place. Many wonderful things. Mrs. Iverson may not have been quite so thrilled to move again, but she didn't say anything about it. And they had kind of a hard personal life when they got here because having children in the middle of the wilderness, there's no doctor available, so if something bad happens, you might lose a child, and they did lose several children. They are buried in our little cemetery up on the hill. The Iversons didn't stay forever, but those children are still kind of a link to him. So we know that there's an Iverson in our town. When they decided to come, they had to find their own way here. That involved mostly boats, because there weren't any roads on the way to Ephraim. So one by one, they all arrived. First, they stayed at Ole Larson's Island. He called it My Island. And it is now, of course, Horseshoe, as we said. And they all built lean-tos. Would you like to spend the entire summer in a lean-to? That doesn't sound wonderful to me. And I don't know what Mrs. Ole Larson thought about having all these people on her property. The Horseshoe Island is not that big. But anyway, that's what they did. And the men of this little congregation rowed over here every morning in a boat in order to clear the land and build some houses. Well, there were only 18 people, and they weren't all men. There were men and women that were married. There were four couples. And then there were several other uh, young men, unmarried. And then there were quite a few children. Now, you know, children aren't any good at building houses. So these uh, six or eight, I think it was eight men, came over every day and cleared land. And Iverson was astute enough to realize that you could not continuously cleared land until winter because you had to build a house or where would you live? So they only cleared enough to build a couple of houses. The first house was a one-room log cabin. The second house was a two-room log cabin. And then the parishioners said, now we have to build Pastor Iverson's house. And he said, oh no, I do not have to be next. Oh yes, you do, they said, and this is the reason. 
we will not have enough money to buy, build a church for quite some time. So we'll have to have our meetings in your house. He said, oh, I think that's right. So he designed his own house with two living rooms or parlors, one to be used for the church, the other to be used for the family parlor. It was a two-story house, and it is the oldest frame house in Door County. It still stands, and you also are allowed to go in it with a docent if you would like to see it. So they built this house and were so thrilled to have it. They got it all under roof and finished before the snow flies, as they used to say, and they were ecstatic. We don't know how that worked with those people. 18 of them total, remember? And they only had two houses plus the pastor's house. We don't know how they blended together and shared the house, but that's what they did. And of course, the following year, they built more houses and continued to do so. However, the following year, a lot more people happened to come. Another boat came, anchoring first at Horseshoe Island, expecting to live in Ephraim, but there was a very unwelcome being on board. It was cholera. Seven or eight of them died waiting to get better, but some of those people who persevered and were able to get over that dread disease, remember we had no penicillin back then, some of those people have relatives descendants still here in Ephraim today. So it's a lot of fun when you see somebody that is really from the olden days. Now, if you've been to Europe, you know that the olden days in Europe are much older. But in Ephraim, our olden days go back to 1853 when those first people came. But they couldn't afford a church, as we said. And finally, four or five years later, actually in 1857, they decided that Things had been good long enough that they would be able to purchase or build a church, which they did. Pastor Iverson had designed it. We are in the church right now. The part behind me was added much later, and there is a part behind this central building. But this is 44 feet long and 22 feet wide, and that used to be the front door. And then between those two beautiful stained glass windows is where the front door used to be. But it was not built here. It was built down on the shore. Can you imagine doing something like that? Pastor Iverson was quite upset about it. He wanted it built here. Of course, his pastor's house was right behind me, so it would have been very convenient for him. But that is not the only reason. He wanted the view of our beautiful bay and the cliffs, which looks so much like Norway. But you know, you pick your battles. And he decided he <coughs> excuse me, wouldn't worry about it. They would build on the shore, which they did. Not a good idea. We are subject in Ephraim, perhaps in all of Door County, perhaps in Wisconsin, to rising and falling water. This particular year, which is 2020, we have extremely high water. They say it is the highest water that we have ever experienced. Only 10 years ago, they were all bemoaning the fact that we had almost no water. So it comes and goes. That wasn't good for the Moravian church because the water came into the church. I don't think Iverson liked it very well either when he had to walk through snow in order to get to the church. But of course, he couldn't complain about that because everybody who lived wherever they lived had to walk through snow to get there. But the water was a problem. And they knew that it might happen again. So, at about this point, Pastor Iverson was called to another church, and we got a new pastor here. His name was Grenfeld, and he was here for quite a number of years, and he too thought that the church should be where it is today. So, the year before he left to go to his new position, 1882, he decided that somehow or another they were going to move the church up here. Well, 40 feet long is a lot of a house to move anywhere. They did it. They had oxen and horses to pull it. They put logs. We have plenty of logs here, plenty of trees. They took all the branches off and all the logs were laid along the church and they pulled it onto the first log and then pulled it some more 
and then our oxen were behind pushing and they got the church up on these rollers and they brought it up the hill. Well, that wasn't even easy. The hill has a curve in it and then you have to come this way and when they get to this part of our road, right outside the church is the little road, there's another hill to get the church up. So they finally did it all and they never broke anything I think that is remarkable. They positioned the church differently than it was down on the shore with the front door facing out. And it wasn't for years and years when they finally decided that they had to enlarge the church and this part was put up so that there would be a place for the choir to sit and the pastor would be above them. They used to have the uh, pastor's pulpit over here and they would come in, sit down, face this way. Well, they changed the whole configuration and then we had wider pews because the length had become the width of the church. So after this was built, then back there, they put in a fireplace that might be about 20 feet long back there. And uh, long after that, a family named Helgeson provided us with all the stained windows that are in the back. The beautiful stained windows up here in the front and on that side have been given by various family members in honor or memory of someone. In fact, my great-grandfather has a window with Jesus holding the sheep. But when they had to put so many more windows in, in the back, the Helgeson family did all that, with one exception, the Anderson family did one. So we are very, very fortunate to have stained glass windows. Some people ask me whether this is typical of all Moravian churches. I don't think there is a typical Moravian church, but perhaps if there were, it would be less fancy. It might not have stained glass windows. This is just because we had lovely parishioners who wanted to give a gift to this community. But many Moravian churches are not made out of wood, as this one is. Many of them are made of brick and stone. I have seen all kinds. It doesn't matter, does it? When you are in church, you know you're in God's house, so it doesn't matter what the church is made of or what it looks like. Everybody has been so thrilled with this little community. And in the summer, when all the summer people do come, they help us out in a way that you might not guess. Because in the old days, people used to come for the whole summer. If the family couldn't stay all together, the mother and the children would stay here and they all attended this church. Later on, we had the Lutheran church and then they had many people go to that. In fact, there was a big community of Lutherans who lived in this, what is now the state park. And when they were told that it was going to become a state park, and they had to get out, many of them had been accustomed to going here to church, but Ephraim was already kind of filled up by then, so they went elsewhere. So we have the Lutherans, some of whom live in Ephraim, but many of them live in Bailey's Harbor, Egg Harbor, Sister Bay, and of course, many years have passed since then, and more churches have been built. Iverson was the one who started the church in Sister Bay. He also started the church in Sturgeon Bay. He was on the go a lot, which was not very pleasant for his poor wife who was home alone with children who were sometimes sick and dying. He had to walk everywhere for the first several years because he couldn't afford a horse. When he finally did get a horse, then he would even go as far as Green Bay. Of course, everyone had to go to Green Bay at some point, usually in the summer, so they could go by boat because we didn't have much in the way of stores up here at first. In fact, the Anderson store in downtown Ephraim is only about 100 years old, and after that came, everybody was thrilled, and then we got two or three more stores at one time or another. In fact, my great-great-uncle bought a store from a man named Peter Peterson who thought he would settle here. Then he changed his mind, went back to Norway. Sometimes people just can't decide what they want to do. Anyway, stores were plenty at last, but at first everybody had to go to Green Bay and they would come home with 50 pound sacks of flour. Would you like to carry that home in your bag? 100 pound bags of sugar and they had to buy everything else that you could imagine that could be kept. Lots of them had root cellars, so things could be kept for a while. And pretty soon when the farmers came, I hope everybody knows how happy we were when the Germans came, because although the land here in downtown Ephraim was all used up, 
They didn't care. This is hilly land. They didn't want hilly land. They wanted farms. So they moved up the next hill, and many farmers produced beautiful things, all kinds of grain, animals to buy for meat, everything you could expect, dairy farms, because of course now Wisconsin is known for its dairy. Many things happened, but they all took a lot of time. So all these people were really pioneers. I am very glad that it was my great-grandfather who was a pioneer and not me. I'm not very good at being cold and having to walk 10 miles and being out in the blustery rain and all that sort of thing. I, I like my creature comforts. So luckily, I can have them thanks to these pioneers who took such good care of us. And the Moravian Church has some interesting little, I guess you'd call them customs, and the, the one I like the best is called the Love Feast. Back in the day when the Norwegians, I think now, I'm getting out ahead of myself, when the people from Moravia thought they had to go out and they went to Germany because it was safer there, they met this wonderful man, Ludwig von Zinzendorf. He was 23 years old and a count because his parents had died and left him that position. He too lived with his grandmother. He was very, very versed in the Lutheran Church, but he was very tickled when these Moravians showed up from Moravia and he said, oh, build on my land. Have you heard that before? That's just like in Otto Tonk in Green Bay. Zinzendorf did it first. Build your houses on my land. But he was a little disappointed he had read so much about the Moravians, and he didn't see that this group who kept growing were getting along really well. So he had a, a come to the reality meeting with them one day, and he said, you must pray. We're going to have a worship service right now. So he preached for a couple of hours that morning, and everybody suddenly got friendly again. Everybody is thinking that, who is this man and why is he talking to us? And then they listened and they said, this is what the word of God is really about and we haven't been doing it and everybody got friendly again. So Zinzendorf really did us a big favor. After the long meeting was over, he said, I, I really feel badly for you to all go out hungry. So because he was a count and he had plenty of money, he provided lunch for all of these people. And they sat around on the grounds for hours, talking, laughing, singing hymns, and then praying together. And because of that happening, we have a little tradition in this church, which we call the Love Feast. And right in the middle of the service, on a day that it's going to happen, the pastor will signal, and the people will come in, and they will come, uh, the usher type people will come up and serve bread, which is a wafer now that is easier, like a communion wafer. They serve the bread to the people, and then the organist plays lovely music, and at the same time, we all partake of this bread together, and then the next ushers come in with the wine, except we use grape juice, and we have a little communion service together in honor of that day. So, People who come to our church for the first time, let's say as a summer tourist who's never been here, might be a little nonplussed when they find out that we're going to be eating in church. My own son-in-law was horrified the first time we did this. But we said, it's okay. Everybody's used to it, and we can remember how many things we can thank God for in our lives. So that is how that began, and there are many other little customs. Singing is so important. You might wonder why I could talk for such a while about a Moravian faith, which you may never have heard of. It's because of music. The Moravians love their music. In fact, I read that there are about 10,000 hymns that Moravian people have written. That's a lot. So they sing a lot. Not all of their music is very easy. We have sung a lot of it in this church, and some of it is really hard but we try hard and we like the music we make. So between music and love feasts 
and having little children in Sunday school, we are a typical church, but we were the first Protestant church. It's a long time in coming, but everybody now usually has heard of Moravians. I think it's wonderful that Ephraim has such a lovely history, and I hope all of you who are listening to me will come and see us at some point. We'd be so happy to have you. Thank you so much.